Welcome to Crosstalk Solutions. My name's Chris, and this is Free PBX 101 version 15, part 17, where we're actually going to step away from Free PBX for just a moment to talk about the various types of trunking. So I have put together a little bit of a presentation here. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, when we talk about trunking, here in the US, we're typically talking about three different main types of trunking. We've got POTS lines, these are your plain old telephone service, standard copper lines like you would have at your home. Then we have PRI. PRI stands for Primary Rate Interface, and it's essentially a copper cable that consists of 24 individual phone lines or channels within that cable. PRIs have 23 B channels for voice and one D channel for data, such as caller ID. And then finally, we have SIP trunking. Now, SIP trunking is the most common type of telephone service that we see these days, also known as VoIP trunks or SIP trunks. Uh, these IP trunking services vary greatly, and we're going to talk about all of that in this video. All right, so starting off with POTS. Now, POTS lines are still around today, especially in rural areas. If you have a local phone provider, sometimes you can't even port numbers away from those providers. Because if a provider is in a rural enough area, it costs SIP trunking companies a lot of money to have a presence in that area, to have the ability to port out a specific area code and prefix. So unless there's enough business, sometimes SIP trunking providers cannot port numbers away from super rural areas and maybe POTS lines are the only way that you can get trunking. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't use voice over IP. It just means that your connection out to the rest of the world, the public switch telephone network, has to be over POTS, but your phones can still connect to the server using voice over IP, no problem. So in order to connect POTS lines to your server, you're either gonna have to have an FXO card in the server or an FXO gateway, which is a separate appliance that just terminates your POTS lines and then connects to your server using a separate SIP trunk. Now, these are different from FXS cards, which are station cards. Those are for fax machines, analog phones, stuff like that. So in you know, voice over IP, in PBX analog world, there are FXO ports, these are for phone lines, and FXS ports, these are for stations, fax machines, analog phones, etc. Now, when you have POTS lines, especially if you have multiple POTS lines, you may find that your customers or your organization has these POTS lines in what's called a hunt group. So imagine that you have four POTS lines. If someone calls the primary number and it rings through uh, just like a normal phone call would, but now what happens if a second person calls? If they call that primary number, well, it's going to hunt or roll over to the next number in the hunt group or the next POTS line in the hunt group and so on and so forth. So you can have up to as many concurrent calls as you have POTS lines in that hunt group. The downside to doing that is for the outbound, right? So POTS lines go out with the caller ID of the actual line that they went out on. So if your main line, your main phone number is tied up and someone makes an outbound call, it's gonna go out with the caller ID of a second phone line, which might not be ideal for your company. With voice over IP, inbound and outbound can have the same, you know, as many calls as you want inbound and as many calls as you want outbound using the same DID or the same caller ID. Finally, for the POTS lines, for mission critical PBX systems, or for customers who are migrating from POTS lines to SIP trunking, we often recommend, hey, why don't you keep a POTS line, keep a couple of POTS lines as backup. So especially for something like a school, if they're going to switch to all SIP for the cost benefit of switching to voice over IP, that's great, but it's also internet dependent, right? So a mission critical location like a school or a hospital, we always recommend, hey, why don't you hang on to one or two of those POTS lines just in case if anything happens uh, to your internet, you can still make you know emergency calls out on those POTS lines. 
Then we have PRIs, and I actually like PRIs a lot. PRIs to me are one of the easiest ways to transition from one phone system to another because you literally unplug the PRI from your old phone system and plug it into your new phone system and you're back up and running. It's actually, it's actually really wonderful. So a PRI consists of B channels and D channels. B channels are for voice traffic and there's 23 voice channels in a PRI. Then you have one D channel uh, which is for data, right? So that's basically like your caller ID. Prior to PRIs, we used to have T1s, which are basically the same thing. It was 24 channels in one big cable. I say big cable, it's actually a pretty small cable, but it was 24 channels in one cable, but it was all 24 B channels. So no D channels whatsoever. T1s did not have caller ID capability. That's why PRIs became more popular than T1s very quickly after they came out. So PRIs are used most commonly here in the US and in Japan, however, in Europe and most of the rest of the world, more commonly you're gonna find E1 lines. So not PRIs, but E1s. It's the same concept though. E1s are 30 B channels and two D channels. So again, 30 B channels for voice, two separate D channels for data. Now, historically PRIs have utilized the sort of nation's uh, copper infrastructure. They were delivered to businesses via copper, but more and more we're seeing that be replaced. Where a provider such as AT&T or Comcast or Level 3, whomever, will actually provide you with a PRI handoff at the end of an IP circuit, right? So they basically deliver an IP circuit through the internet all the way to your location and then convert it to a PRI that you can plug into your phone system uh, once it actually gets to your premises. And just like POTS lines, PRIs plug into your server uh, via a card that goes directly into your PBX server or into a PRI gateway that then converts that PRI to SIP and shoots it over to your server. Now, one thing I should mention is a lot of folks, when we're transitioning them from a legacy PBX that uses a PRI over to a new PBX that has SIP capability, oftentimes we can just contact their provider and say, hey, listen, we're switching from PRI to SIP and they can just make that change and all they're changing is the handoff. Like you're already getting SIP all the way to the customer premises. It's converting that SIP to a PRI so you can plug it into your old server but oftentimes they can just say, all right, well then we just won't convert it to PRI and we'll go SIP straight into your new server, which is actually, again, there's pros and cons of doing it both ways. Speaking of pros and cons, here are the pros and cons of PRI lines. Number one, they are very easy to migrate from one server to another. Again, unplug the PRI from the PRI port in your old server and plug it into the new server and you have migrated. Uh, they are very reliable. They're not always affected by internet outages, but again, it depends on how they're delivered to your building. If they're delivered over the same fiber that your internet comes through and a backhoe cuts through that fiber, then it's very possible that your PRI will be down along with the rest of your internet connection, even though it seems like it's you know a copper line you know, being terminated to your premises. PRIs are typically pretty expensive. We're talking in the range of 500 to $750 a month with your usage and there could be additional expense in the card and or gateway appliance that needs to go into your infrastructure to support however many PRIs you need. There's also a slight learning curve to configuring PRIs uh, in free PBX, but it's, it's really not that bad. Okay, SIP trunking, right? So SIP trunking, also known as VoIP trunks, uh, this is basically any connection out to the public switch telephone network over an IP network. Uh, SIP trunking can be the most cost-effective way to terminate to the PSTN, and there are many different types of SIP trunking providers. So you've got your per-minute providers, also known as a metered provider. So this is someone like, uh, you know, Clearly IP can do metered trunks. VoIP.ms does all metered trunks. Um, Twilio, I think, is another one that does strictly metered trunks. And essentially what that means is you pay per minute for the minutes that you use, but you're not limited to a certain number of concurrent calls. So you might have one call or a hundred calls, 
it doesn't matter to the SIP trunking provider because you're just paying per minute, no matter how many uh, actual channels you're using or how many actual concurrent calls are happening. Okay, then you have your per channel SIP trunking providers. These are folks where you are buying a certain number of channels, just like if you had a PRI that has 23 channels, that's the maximum concurrent calls that you can make to the outside world. Some SIP providers do it the exact same way. At Crosstalk SIP, for instance, we have packages that include minutes for like a five channel package and a 10 channel package, right? So if you need five concurrent calls to the internet or 10 concurrent calls to the internet, we've got you covered on both of those packages. And of course, you can add additional channels if you need them and keep the same amount of minutes. Contact Crosstalk Solutions for more information about Crosstalk SIP. And finally, we have enterprise level SIP trunking. This is typically where a provider, such as a higher level provider like Level 3 or Comcast or Charter, uh, will deliver a dedicated circuit all the way to your premises. Now, having a dedicated circuit means that the provider can guarantee quality all the way through their circuit, right? So from your PBX all the way to their premises, they can guarantee the quality of that connection but you're gonna pay for that, right? So these enterprise level SIP trunking providers that provide dedicated circuits for your PBX, really good quality, but also really expensive. I mean, we're talking on par with the cost of like a PRI. So there's an overview of the different type of SIP trunking services that are out there. And again, if you are not sure what you need or what you might want, contact Crosstalk Solutions. We are happy to help customers through their SIP trunking needs. And we don't always just sell our own trunks. We sell the trunks that are right for your individual situation. So let's say you've picked out your trunks. There's also essentially two ways to authenticate your trunks out to the SIP trunking provider. SIP registration authenticates you with a username and password, and then IP-based authentication authenticates you with the WAN IP addresses on both sides. So for instance, you're only accepting traffic from the WAN IP addresses of your provider, and your provider's only accepting traffic from your PBX's WAN IP address, and by virtue of just locking it down to IP address on both, side, uh, both sides, that is the authentication mechanism. Moving right along, let's talk about the pros and cons of SIP trunking. So number one, SIP trunking is super cost effective. This is hands down one of the best ways to achieve ROI or return on investment for your PBX system. So when you move from one phone system, like an older legacy phone system with a PRI or POTS lines, and you move into a voice over IP based PBX system, the cost savings by switching to voice over IP will often pay for the cost of the PBX itself within the first year. We typically see an average of about an eight to 12 month ROI when we're transitioning a customer into a free PBX based phone system utilizing SIP trunking. SIP trunking is also very quick to deploy. You can have your SIP trunk up and running in a matter of minutes versus something like a POTS line where you gotta contact the carrier, they have to you know, provision it, deliver it out to your site, someone's gotta come out and hook everything up and all that sort of stuff, right? It's none of that. You can have a SIP trunk up and running very, very quickly. You also have very powerful caller ID options. You can set a different caller ID for every extension that's dialing out. You can have every extension dial out as the same caller ID. You can have some extensions dial out as one caller ID and other extensions dial out as a different caller ID. You can use prefixes so that when you dial a nine, you go out as one caller ID. You dial an eight, you go out as a different caller ID. Again, I could go on and on and on. The caller ID options with voice over IP are superior to any other type of trunking. Now, if you are selling free PBX systems to customers, like if you're an MSP and free PBX um, you know, hardware and services are part of your portfolio of products, I would also recommend getting, you know, getting in good with some SIP trunking providers that have referral programs because you can get a little bit of recurring monthly revenue based on SIP trunking sales to your customers. And finally, uh, E911, right? Super important that we have 911 services for every phone in an organization. Voice over IP SIP trunking makes E911 much, much easier than any other type of trunking. 
What are the cons of SIP trunking? Well, it is not suitable for all customers. If you've got bad internet, if you're on a wireless ISP, if you're in a very rural area, you might not be able to do SIP trunking. It's also susceptible to internet outages. If your internet goes out, sometimes your SIP trunk, your phone lines will be down. Uh, it's also, the setup can be complicated. Um, not a lot of SIP trunking providers provide really good documentation for how to set up their particular SIP trunks. Um, we do for Crosstalk SIP, we have full documentation for how to set everything up. Uh, other vendors such as Clearly IP use like an API token where you just input the API token into FreePBX and it does all of the trunk configuration for you. So there are some providers that do try to make this easier, but again, not all SIP trunking providers are created equal. Okay, final thing I wanna talk about in this video, hybrid options, right? So you are not locked into a single type of SIP trunking when you are shifting to free PBX. Uh, the outbound routes in free PBX can have primary, secondary, tertiary, et cetera, uh, routes out to the public switch telephone network. So some examples. If you use SIP trunking as your primary mechanism for getting out to the public switch telephone network in order to get those cost savings of SIP, you might wanna still keep some POTS lines as backup. As we talked about earlier in this video, the example of a school or a hospital, if your internet goes out and your SIP trunking is down, at least you would still have those POTS lines for backup. Another thing that we see is a lot of folks like to hang on to their PRIs but they will use SIP trunking as a backup to the PRI, either for least cost routing, right? So basically if something's cheaper to send over the voice over IP trunk than the PRI, let's use that. So for instance, maybe international calls are very expensive on your PRI, but they're not as expensive when you're using SIP trunking. Well, you can set it up so that you use your PRI for all of your normal inbound and outbound domestic minutes, but you use SIP trunking when you call internationally. It's also excellent for rural options when you can't port out uh, DIDs from POTS lines, right? So again, as I talked about earlier, not all SIP trunking providers have a footprint in every single area code and prefix uh, in the United States or in whatever country that you're from. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't use SIP for outbound calls, right? So essentially, if your phone numbers, if your company's main phone number is stuck on a POTS line and you cannot change that, well, you can keep those POTS lines just for inbound calls and then use SIP for outbound. This way, someone calls inbound to your main number, they're gonna hit that hunt group and roll over to however many POTS lines that you have and then for all outbound calls, you're not taking up your POTS lines and you're still out pulsing your main caller ID for all of your outbound calls. So again, just a few examples. SIP trunking is very, very flexible. When you are doing a hybrid setup like this too, it can really be beneficial to your business. All right, in our next video, we are actually going to be setting up a crosstalk SIP trunk. So stay tuned for that one. We will see you guys in the next video.